So I've pretty much always considered myself a gamer. I think I was about six years old when I played my first video game at a friend's house. And I remember being so, so jealous that they had this really awesome device that they could play with whenever they wanted. And a year later, I got one of these, the Donkey Kong Game and Watch. So the controls on this were fairly straightforward. There was a button on the right to jump and a button on the left to go left and right and move. And you basically controlled Mario from Super Mario Brothers and had to avoid the barrels that Donkey Kong, this giant monkey, were throwing at you. And there wasn't really much to learn about the game. It took a while to master and to actually score a high score, but the rules of the game were fairly simple. So throughout my life, I've played a lot of different games. And as technologies have evolved and graphics have gotten better, the games have become more and more complex. So there are so many games out there right now that require you to actually put time and effort into really fully mastering the game. And my favorite example of this is Horizon Zero Dawn. So in the game, you need to battle these um, robot animals. And it starts off with these reasonable small creatures that you can kill with a single arrow shot. But as the game goes on, the creatures become larger and meaner and trickier to kill. And it actually takes a lot of time before you're able to take down the biggest robots. It's a game where you need to master the different weapons and understand the different qualities of the robots that you're hunting. And as games have gotten more complex, game designers put way more time into creating environments where people are happy, engaged, and willing to put the time and effort into learning and mastering these new skills. And I realize it's not unlike the work that I do in creating environments for developers where they're happy, engaged, and willing to put the time and effort into mastering and learning new skills. So I'm a technical manager at FutureLearn, and as mentioned in the intro, we're a social learning platform offering online courses, programs, and degrees, and our company mission is to transform access to education. So I've been here for six years now. Um, I joined the company um, as an engineer, and I've seen our tech team grow from um, a tiny team of six um, to the 33 that we are now today. And as a tech team, part of our strategy is to grow our own software engineers. So since our entire company is about learning, we believe that we should invest in our people, and when possible, we should try to hire less experienced people rather than hiring only the most senior software engineers. So we do this for several reasons. So for starters, it makes it easier to hire from, um, since the pool that we're hiring from is much larger. Um, and we can do our part in making the tech community more diverse. And next to that, it also shows that we care about people's progression, and it makes it easier to retain people. It does mean, though, that we really need to make sure that our team is constantly capable of leveling up and having those processes and structures in place that enable people to do that. So the way I see it is that as a manager, I'm responsible for the internal developer experience. So from the time a person applies for a job with us to their onboarding and time at the company, all the way to when they decide to leave, we need to make sure that people have the best experience that they can have. So I've been full-time focused on pretty much this uh, for the past two years now. And the more I do this, the more I realize that this is just another form of user experience. So it's all about understanding the motivations, the emotions, and the behaviors of people, and then providing the best experience that you can for them. So I wanted to specifically focus here on game user experience, 
because I think it's a very similar type of environment that we're trying to create. So an environment where people are engaged and focused on learning and mastering specific skills. So that's what this talk is about. I'll be looking at 10 lessons that we can learn from game design and then how we can apply that to teams. So one thing to note here is I'm not talking about gamification here. So this isn't about making your time at the company more like a game where you score points and there's a leaderboard for most kick-ass engineer. This is not about that. This isn't about how we can gamify work. It's about using analogies from game user experience to better understand how we can make the developer experience better. So to structure this talk a little bit more, I'll look at three different areas of game design. And within those areas, I'll highlight different game examples, um, what lessons we can learn from them, and how to apply those lessons in your team with some practical examples. So our first area is starting a new game. So I mentioned an example before of um, this Donkey Kong game where the controls were purely left, right, and jump. So nowadays, games are much more complex than that. So this is an overview of the game controls of Uncharted. And even though I've played this game before, I'm still overwhelmed by the amounts of different things that you can do. But most games, though, they won't just drop you into the game and go, right, off you go, figure it out. Almost every game nowadays has a phase introduction of the various game mechanics. So in Uncharted, each of the controls get introduced one at a time. So in Uncharted 4, one of the first encounters is with this guy, where you learn how to punch. So you get this little message here telling you to hit square to attack the enemy. And then later on, you get another scene where you learn how to interact with an object by pressing triangle. And then eventually, in similar ways, you learn how to dodge, jump, climb, and shoot a gun until you're able to do all the basic actions. And in this game, it's done fairly quickly. So within the first half an hour, you've pretty much learned the core mechanics of the game. And it's all staged in such a way that you focus on one skill at a time. So in other games, this staging takes place across the entire game. So for instance, in God of War, as the story progresses, you slowly learn new abilities that allow you to solve different puzzles and unlock different areas. So the image here shows this chest with these weird red vine thingies on top of them, which you can only destroy once you've got the ability to throw these weird red boom thingies at the weird red vine thingies. So the game slowly builds up what you need to know, allowing you to learn gradually. So lesson number one is don't overload new starters. So when someone new joins, they've got a lot to learn. There's new people, new ways of working, a new code base, new terminology, new abbreviations. So you need to come up with a way to stage your onboarding and actually plan it out more deliberately. So the main thing that we have is an onboarding checklist that we create for each new starter. So we have an onboarding template board in Trello, which we regularly update. And the week, the, the week before a new starter starts, we create a copy and customize it. So the board contains a cheat sheet, so a list of useful information that might be tricky to remember. So names, where certain people sit, links to various internal sites, um, so it's all about reducing the amount of info that a person needs to remember. It includes a breakdown of what we expect them to do and by when. So looking at the first few days, the first two weeks, the first month and the third month. So it's all about setting the expectations of what they'll be doing. And then we have various things to read and links to guidelines and resources and stuff like that. 
So it's all about allowing a new starter to just have one starting point where they can find all the info that they need to get going. So going back to video games, another thing to note when starting a new game is who is responsible for teaching these new skills. So a lot of the early games would come with a manual that exactly explained to that exactly explained what each button did, how the game was played, how you score points, etc. And I remember playing games where I kind of just skimmed the manual, threw it away, went, I can do this, I don't need that. And then only discovered that a certain move was possible about a month after playing when a friend had pointed it out. Turned out I was playing the game wrong that entire time. And that doesn't really happen nowadays anymore. At the time, the onus was really on the player to figure it out. Nowadays, though, most games embed that onboarding aspect into the game. The game is the one responsible for teaching the new thing. So going back to Uncharted, it's just a simple hovering message. But it is a hovering message that won't disappear until you actually hit the stupid square button. So in other games, you might have a sidekick or a wise old man who explains to you what this new ability is that you've got and how to use it. And in those games, the teacher is much more embedded as part of the storytelling. But in both cases, it's the game, that it's, it's the game itself that goes, right, now it's time to learn something. So lesson number two is support and guide new starters. So it's all well and good to have an onboarding plan and a checklist, but you don't want your new starter to go at it completely alone. So whenever someone new starts, we pair them up with a mentor. So the mentor is on their same team and sits close by to them, and they're there to help support and guide the new starter during the first few months. So they don't necessarily have to pair directly on work together the entire time, but the mentor is supposed to make sure that the new starter has something to work on and is around for any questions that they might have. And they, just, and they should just generally be the first point of reference that the new starter can go to. And we make sure that they regularly catch up and together come up with a plan for anything that additionally needs to go into that onboarding board that I mentioned before. So final thing when you start a new game is understanding what your current goal is. So once a player knows how to play the game, they still need to be able to figure out and choose what missions or quests to uh, focus on and how to achieve them. So this is an example from Horizon Zero Dawn, which I mentioned earlier. So on the left, you have multiple quests that you can choose from. And then whichever one you have selected, it shows a breakdown of all the different things that you still need to do to achieve that mission. So similarly, once you've got a mission selected, it will appear as this to-do list on the left of the screen with what you still do, need to do to achieve your goal. So again, a lot of the older games that I played didn't really do any helpful stuff like this. So I've played games where when I accepted a quest, I was told that I had to go to this little village called something generic like Happy Water or Greenfield, or Boring by the Sea. <laughs> and then I left the game for a couple of weeks, because I went on a holiday or something like that, came back to it, and I just didn't remember what the name of that stupid bloody village was called. And the game provided no other clues as to where you would have to go or what you had to do next. And you were either forced to restart the game or try to look it up in one of those paper manuals that you could find. Um, so it was a really rubbish experience. So lesson number three is make it clear what people should focus on. So in our team, we expect everyone to set personal development goals and to reflect and review them on a regular basis. So we don't want people to set goals once a year and then forget to look at them and make progress on them. As a manager, I should be regularly checking in with people and making sure that they're continually working on their goals. It's also why we want people to write down their goals and record what they've done. 
Because even if they hadn't achieved um, the goal that they had set, most of the cases, it's because they've learned something else instead. And they should be recording and writing down what that something else was. Next to that, they should also tie in with the bigger picture career goals that a person has. So I won't go into too much detail here because I've got an entire talk just solely on this. Um, but it's really important for people to understand um, how their personal goals fit in with what they actually want to do with like, the rest of their lives. And once people have set goals, we encourage them to look for opportunities to share them with team members. Mainly because having them visible means that someone else might be able to help out with them, encourage them, motivate them on something, um, or they might be able to delegate a piece of work specifically to them. So the second area that we're going to look at is how games help with learning new skills. And one of the most important aspects of learning something new is understanding whether or not what you're doing is the right or the wrong way of doing it. And typically, games are really, really good at giving feedback in this type of way. And I struggled with coming up with an example that really did it badly. So going back to the Uncharted example, it's kind of low key here. Once you've pressed the square button, the message will just disappear. And a lot of the feedback in that game is that same type of feedback that you would expect in real life. If you misjudge a jump, miss a ledge, you fall to your death and die. It's not the type of feedback that most people are expecting, but it is a type of feedback. In the same way, if you shoot an enemy, he bleeds and the enemy dies. So we might not think of it as feedback, but the game is actively telling you whether, an effect, whether an action that you did had an actual immediate effect. Hey, you shot right, this guy died. Anyway, lesson number four is give people immediate feedback. So when possible, we want to encourage our team members to give each other direct and immediate feedback and timely feedback. So especially when it's constructive feedback, it needs to be delivered in a timely manner. And it's part of our, um, it's part of my role as a manager to facilitate that this actually happens. So one of the things that I tend to do is just making myself available for um, um, if someone wants to prepare for a conversation they need to have with someone else, um, or even if they want to role play to trial out how it is um, to deliver a piece of feedback. Because it's not something that we typically are taught in any real way. And there are two books that I found that are really helpful when getting people thinking, uh, to get people thinking about feedback. So the first is Difficult Conversations. And this is a book that is all about approaching conversations and structuring them in a better way so that, so that the points that you're trying to make have a better impact. And it's not just a useful book for difficult conversations. I think any conversations or communications um, that you have will benefit from the approach in this book. So just think about the dialogue that you have when you pair with someone. And explicitly think about what impact your words would have on the other person. The other book that is really useful is from the same writer is called Thanks for the Feedback. So this one is written much more from the point of view of being able to hear and take in feedback and understand what the various triggers are that might make you react to feedback. So I thought I was quite open and understanding about receiving feedback. But last year I read this book right before I got some feedback. And I noticed myself reacting and dismissing some things in exactly the way that the book said I would. And while I was reading the book, I was like, oh yeah, other people do this type of stuff. I don't. 
I'm much more open than that. Um, and then when I actually got the feedback, it was like, oh, wait a minute. And yeah, it, I, I do this, these things as well. So this book is really helpful for getting you, making you more open to receive the feedback, but it also, on the flip side, allows you to understand what impact you might have when you are giving feedback to someone else and what type of triggers that person might react with. So going back to games again, sometimes feedback doesn't happen immediately. But rather, the game allows you to review and look back at something that you did. So for instance, in Overwatch, when you're playing a match against other players, if you get killed, the game waits for 10 seconds before you can get back into the fight. But rather than do nothing here, the game shows you how you died and uses it as an opportunity to learn from. So lesson number four, five, I labeled it wrong, provide space to reflect and learn from the past. So I try to encourage people to do more self-reflection and really get a sense of how you've done things recently. So lots of teams often do retrospectives for their team, but people rarely do this activity on their own for their own actions. And I think lots of people can benefit from just stopping and taking that time to just review what they've done. Beyond self-reflection though, the other best resource to learn from is feedback from other people in a much more recurring um, and regular structure. So we're currently using a tool called 15.5 to help with our like 360 degree feedback where people can nominate peers and the feedback is given by those peers, the manager and the person themselves. And the tool takes care of all the nudging, anonymizing and sharing like that. So it makes it a whole lot easier to manage. So since setting it up, we've collected feedback on a much more regular basis, meaning people have received feedback on a much more regular basis. So going back to Uncharted again, at this stage of the game, you normally also can't die yet. That guy there will just stand there and keep on punching you until you punch back. So the game is set up to ease you into learning and applying these new skills. So you can just stand there being punched the entire time until you hit the stupid square button. Another example is Mass Effect, where you can go to the shooting range um, to train and try out your different weapons and powers. And throughout this all, you don't deal with any actual enemies. So you can't die again, and it allows you to just trial out and learn how to master specific skills. So lesson number six is provide opportunities to apply new skills. So at FutureLearn, every person has a training budget, which isn't uncommon, but we really try to get people thinking about how they'll use their budget in a way that works for them. So while I love conferences, I know that not everyone finds them as useful. And I often suspect that we encourage people to use their budget on conferences because that's kind of the easy option for us. So it's up to me as a manager to help identify what other types of training are out there. So things like improv workshops, writing or public speaking courses, getting a trainer in for a day that could help our entire team to uh, learn something. So I need to be the one to find and offer the opportunities that people can use their budget on. Beyond that though, we make it explicit that people get personal development time during their normal work hours. So we've made it a default that everyone on the team should be spending half a day per sprint on learning and developing themselves. So some people might require more time, other people less, but having that default explicit means that we're setting that expectation that people should be taking this time and that they should be doing it during work hours. So one of the things people can spend that time on are our different internal learning events. 
So these are regular events that are mostly self-organized for people to get together and learn something in different ways. So these are just a couple of them. Um, so in Talks We Love, we watch and discuss an interesting talk that someone has seen already. In Learning Hours, someone will teach something random, which is much more workshop-like. Architecture Club and Front End Catch Up are for the people who are interested in those topics to get together and discuss like what the, whatever has happened recently. And in Converse Club and Leadership Study Group are for people who want to improve their public speaking and leadership skills. So they're all different ways for people to learn something internally. And then finally, we also have book clubs and course clubs for people who want to read or take an online course. We then meet up regularly to discuss the progress that they're making and how to apply what they've learned to their work. So the final area that we're looking at is the actual leveling up of a character. So not all games allow you to do this, but there are a lot of role playing, action, and even racing games nowadays that have some form of leveling. And there are a lot of different ways that games have implemented this ability to level up. So in this section, I really want to look at some of the variations um, and the effect that they have on the player. So the basic concept of leveling up is this. You, your character starts at a specific level. You gain experience by doing things in the game, like battling enemies or finding treasure. Some games will call this experience points. Other might call it skill points or action points. But they all pretty much mean the same thing, a way to increase your level. Now, up until this stage, I think most games are quite consistent. There are some exceptions, but the majority of games with leveling up will follow this pattern, where they differ is with what happens when you reach that next level. So the simplest version is where when you reach the next level, your character becomes stronger in some predefined set way. So for instance, in Kingdom Hearts, which is a game where you get to meet various Disney characters, and Goofy and Donald are your sidekicks, each level up is associated with a specific increase or ability. So that picture in the top right shows a message that Goofy is now level three, and therefore his defense has increased. With level four, his strength will increase, and with level five, he unlocks a special ability. So in this type of leveling, with each level up, you get a specific increase that the game has preset. But it's a way to celebrate your character getting stronger and progressing through the game. So lesson number seven is acknowledge people's growth. So I'm always surprised to hear that there are companies out there that will only give salary increases if a person asks and lobbies for it themselves. So in my opinion, you should start off with the assumption that engineers will learn and grow. And you should always be taking the time to review and adjust their salaries accordingly. So we do salary reviews for every person every year. So most of the time, we'll at least try to give an, an, uh, an inflationary increase. And then depending on the person and the progress that they've made that year, we'll either give them a small, medium, or large increase. And with each review, we compared salaries of the people in the team with comparable skills and experience to make sure that we're always being fair and consistent across the entire team. So going back to games, the next type of leveling up all allow the player a choice to what happens when they level up. So in the first variation of this, the player gets to choose themselves what stats or attributes they want to increase. So an example of this is Dark Souls. So those values in blue, which are quite hard to see on the screen, 
Um, they're all attributes that the player can choose to invest in and increase. So in these games, it's really important to know what each attribute means, how it affects you, and how you can apply it in the game. So lesson number eight is expose common competencies and how they are used. So we've got several sets of competencies based on what role you have. So we started with the ones for our software engineers, which are curiosity, communication, technical skills, teamwork skills, and initiative. So we use these whenever we're hiring and interviewing to make sure that we're always taking all of these areas into account. And that, again, uh, that we're consistent and fair in how we're reviewing people. We also then have more advanced competencies for the more senior roles in the team. And we can use these again in conversations about career progression and setting goals or during um, when providing feedback. So five of those competencies are shared and then each role has one or two individual ones as well. So having those competencies means that we're framing all of these discussions with the attributes that we value and care about. And we're also being explicit and transparent that these are the values that we care about. Plus, we also have a common agreed on language that we can use to discuss these things. So the next way a character can level up is by choosing a special ability rather than a stat to increase. And this is where skill trees and pathways appear in games. So this is Horizon Zero Dawn again. And at the start of the game, you have the skills in that first row. So each time you level up, you gain skill points, and you, ex you can exchange your skill points to unlock whichever of the skills you want. You are bound to the order of the ones that are connected, though. So you can't unlock something in the fourth layer until you've gotten the ones above it. But in the end, though, all the players end up with unlocking everything in the tree. It's very much up to you to decide which skills you do first, but you always end up with everything if you stick with the game. A similar example is the latest Tomb Raider. It's a different way of visualizing it, but here a similar thing applies. You can only invest in the skills adjacent to the ones that you already have. The customization, again, is in the different order in which you complete these, but in the end, you'll hopefully have everything unlocked. Another approach is where it's much more modular. So this is Mass Effect's Andromeda. And in here, you never expect it to unlock every single skill. You can only invest in a certain number of them. And it's up to you to decide what type of character you want to create. And it very much also depends on your style of playing and what the right decisions are for you. So another version of the same type of game is Assassin's Creed. So here you have three different areas. And again, it's up to you to choose what abilities work for you. So you never get enough points to unlock everything here. And you need to be quite strategic. For instance, if you rarely use your bow, it's not really wise to invest your points into that hunter area on the left side, since that will only be affecting stuff that you do with your bow. So both me and my husband play this game, and I'm always fascinated in seeing the different skills that we've unlocked and how our gameplay is quite different. I would not be able to play with the character that he's created, and I don't think he could play with, with my one. So lesson number nine is allow people to choose their own path. So what I mean with that is allowing people to generalize or specialize whichever way they want. So we used to have the titles front-end and back-end engineers. But a few years back, we got rid of both of those titles and just turned it into software engineers. We noticed that having those labels were creating, it was creating unnecessary barriers. We didn't really acknowledge the different types of skills that people had that weren't quite covered by either of those two areas. So rather than expect everyone to be full stack or that everyone fits nicely, in a front-end or a back-end box, we're giving people the opportunity to choose what skills they want to invest in. 
So we've recently introduced this spreadsheet where people can say how comfortable they are in specific areas. So we mainly use this for figuring out the makeup of the teams and ensuring that we balance the skills in the right way. And we use it for people to find out who on the team they should be going for when dealing with something. And it shows a whole lot more than just backend or frontend. It shows all the skills that we value and care about. So finally, what all these games do are visualizing and explaining how to progress in a game. They're all quite different styles, and there's quite a lot of complexity in it. But all of these accomplish getting the player familiar with what is possible and allowing them to compare and understand what might be right for them. So final lesson is visualize what progression looks like. So we introduced a career development framework last summer, but we're currently working on a newer version of it. So the first one we had was very linear, so similar to the first games that we looked at, where everyone was expected to progress in a similar way, one level at a time. And we realized though that this didn't really work for us and decided to go for a much more modular approach. Plus, we also really wanted to link it to our competencies and to our different roles. So it's still a work in progress, but it looks broadly like this. And there's a lot going on in there, so I'm going to break it down very quickly. So to start, we have three, uh, six different tracks. Each track is associated to different competencies. And then each competency is linked to one or more roles. So those are the competencies that I mentioned before um, for, the different role, uh, for the different roles that we have. We then have four levels within each track. Each track will then have three to five behaviors across those four levels. And then when people start, we expect that they'll all be in this initial column. But as people progress, we expect there to be more variation. So one person might have these sections completed, focusing primarily kind of like on the top tracks, while someone else might have a completely different shape entirely. So it's much more modular because people are different types of shapes. They wouldn't necessarily want to focus on the same things at the same time, if at all. And then we wanted to visualize what minimum level each role should be. So our software engineers, um, should all be at least within level one. Our line managers should be at least within level two. Our technical leads need to be level two in most areas, except for the collaboration and team management track. And then the same thing for our technical architects, but in a different track. And then lastly, our technical managers need to be at least level three in management skills. So the last thing the overview shows is where the responsibility and priorities of the roles lie. So this is to highlight what the focus of the roles primarily will be and who in a way should be taking ownership of those areas. So it's also a work in progress. We mainly figured out the structure of how we want it to look like. So we're currently working on the actual breakdown of the different tracks and then figuring out what elements should go in there. So the idea of this progression framework is really to use it as a tool to help people have discussions about career progression and for people to plan and figure out what they next should focus on in the same way that video games allow people to see where they are and what is possible for them. So those are 10 lessons of game design that we can apply to building cultures where people are engaged, motivated, to learn, progress, and level up. So to recap, I'm not gonna read them out because then I'm just gonna get too tired. But if you wanna take a photo, do so. So these aren't just the only lessons that you can take from it. These are the ones that jumped out to me. So the next time that you play a game, I want you just to stop and think, is there something in this game in the way it's trying to teach me something that I can learn from and apply to what I do.
So my main focus is creating developer experiences. So I think in the busyness and hecticness of what we do, it's really easy to lose sight that in a way, the developers on our teams are in a way users too. Everyone here should be responsible for helping create experiences that allow other people to grow, progress, and level up, and think about how you might want to apply that to your teams. So thanks for listening. <laughs>